Welcome back to Ty and That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham, and this is my good buddy, Ty Frank. Um, what are we talking about today, Ty? I have no idea. I'm totally yeah. unprepared. Neither do I. Joseph, what are we talking about today? <laughs> you okay there, buddy? That was the lowest. Uh, Welcome back. We're talking about Arrival. <laughs> we're talking about the movie Arrival by Denis Villeneuve, written by the amazing, brilliant Ted Chang. Yeah, he didn't he didn't work on the screenplay, but he wrote the the novella that the the movie is based on and it's one of the best science fiction stories ever written. And uh somehow somehow they managed to do an adaptation of that incredible story that didn't fuck it up, which is amazing. When I said written by him, I was meaning the 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 short yep. story that the movie is based off by Eric Heiser, who you've probably seen a lot of his movies. He did the sequel to the thing he did the uh, he did one of the uh, nightmare on Le- nightmare on Elm Streets. He, he's a he's done a lot of you know we love horror. He's done a lot of horror movies. Oh, he did the uh, Joseph. This is where you jump in. Bird Box. Oh, Bird Box. Yeah, but it's pretty incredible. Uh, if 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 I so I read um, Ted Chan came to visit set. Yeah. Uh, and right before he came to visit set, you were telling me about his. Um, book of short stories that this one came from and i just read that book of short stories and i remember uh, the story of your life just flooring me i mean it yeah. was typically science fiction when i read pure science fiction like that it doesn't really move me emotionally and it stimulates me intellectually you know and there's some things that are curious but when it it attacks me on all my senses <laughs> Uh, I'm like, Jesus, this guy can write, man. He's a really fantastic writer. But then he, he ended up coming to set and visit, and it was really cool to get to meet him, uh, somebody that has that level of talent and just highly, highly skilled um, in what he does. So when I first watched the movie Arrival, did we watch that together? Was that something that came? No, no. Oh, okay. I, I remember watching it with somebody. But my first viewing of Arrival was not, it wasn't as, I, I didn't love it as much as I did the second time. So I, I rewatched it last night because there were a few things um, that were different in the movie that were than, the, than the, the short story. And I was such a fan of the short story. It just bumped me a little bit. It just kind of took me out of it. Well, and, I, and I think the screenplay makes one very large mistake. It's not big enough to ruin the movie. It's not big enough to make it a bad movie. It's still a great movie. But there is one huge mistake in the screenplay that I wish they hadn't done that bumped me too. We can, we can talk about it when we get to it. But yeah. Uh, by the way, if you have not seen Arrival, we're about to spoil the shit out of it. We're going to so. spoil the shit out of it. And Arrival is one of, the, one of the best science fiction movies of the last 20 years. So if you haven't seen it, do yourself a favor, go watch it right now. So I watched Arrival last night, and I watched it alone, which is the best way to watch the movies. And I watched it alone, and uh, and I it's been so long since I read the 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 story, the story of your life. I I ended up rereading it this morning, but at the t- like last night when I watched it, I couldn't remember what were the things that were different in the in the movie and different in the. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was. Yeah. De- I really, really had a different experience the second time on viewing it. You know, it, there's just a lot of really smart, skilled people that are involved in that story, yeah. um, from the the from Ted to Vin- Denis Villeneuve to Eric, who wrote the script, uh, to the actors, to Amy Adams, who's fantastic in it. There's just she's amazing in it. Mm-hmm. When, how many times have you seen it? I don't know, but two or three. I've seen it a couple of times. I, I watched it. And then I and then I showed Janae, and then I I think I showed like I've I've shown a number of other people the movie and watched it with them because um, mm. I was really when it right after it came out and it was available on streaming and stuff I uh, I really sort of proselytized for it to get as many people watching it as I could. You know, maybe we can talk about. So then I went back and read this this story um, this morning, and I started thinking about some of the major major alterations for the movie, and and we'll get to. The scene, the the one of the alterations you're talking about, but because I saw the movie last night and I was and I almost forgot about every like I didn't know the differences and I kind of forgot about it. I just thoroughly enjoyed it in itself and what it was. When I went back, I can see clearly um, or at least clearer why they made the choices they made. 
And I don't necessarily disagree with him. Like the, the, one of the first alterations is Louise's arc. And these are just my, uh, what I just kind of noticed right away. And I'm sure you're going to have a lot more and be different, but Louise in the book, it starts off and she's already living in that time loop. So she, it's like everything. And it's, I mean, structurally it's brilliant. Like, you know, it's, you're learning the lesson, the circular lesson that, that she's learning as through her communication and her knowledge to the alien, but how the, in the story itself, it's yep. teaching you like the alien, the alien taught her. And so there's something about this crazy timeline where she can see where she's living in the past, the present and the future all at once in the story. And it starts off like that, where the movie has a bit more of an arc where it starts off in the, in the, I guess the future where you have that relate that the relationship with her and her, her daughter, then it, it's a bit more linear all the way to get to like the midpoint where it's, it, she's having her experience with the alien. And then as soon as she starts communicating with the alien, then she starts going back to the, to the girl that we saw in the beginning. And so it's, she's starting to evolve into having this sight of being able to see it, her circular reality happening all at once and then, I, and then as the, the more she learns, it progresses the plot and helps her as she's yeah. trying to solve these certain issues. And, 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 and I don't think there was any way to shoot, effectively shoot the way Ted Chang wrote the story. He mm-hmm. wrote a story that I don't think is filmable in its pure form. And so I understand why they made the changes. But one of the things they did is the voiceover narration, her voice talking, she is giving you the hints that she's already in that place in the voiceover, but we just don't understand those hints yet because mm-hmm. we don't, we, you know, we're not with her yet. Mm-hmm. But once you, if on your second watch through it, when you listen to that voiceover, you're like, Oh yeah. Okay. This is, this is the all seeing version of her that's mm-hmm. talking right now. Right. And we eventually catch up to that idea. And I, which I thought was a smart, a smart way to do it because I think if you had tried to film a literal version of the story, it would just it would have just been really confusing. The, I think the sh- the story the novella is a novella is a short story. Would you say it's a, it's a novella? Okay, so if you take the novella, it works on every level. Yeah, I don't think the film version of that would have worked, or I don't know how they would have pulled it off without making some alterations. It, like the the other alteration I saw was instead of they would go in the in the short story, you go to viewing windows and you go to like these screens. Uh, the aliens didn't, the, the ships didn't come down to Earth. They were in the atmosphere. And so you would go to these screens and then you would communicate through the screen, which I don't know would have hold through the whole movie. Yeah. You know, when you're watching a movie, there's something so compelling about them going into the ship and then being face to face with these alien beings. And uh, they were there. So that, like, there was more conflict and tension. It also, I think, spiraled like the movie's version of the ticking clock where the, uh, paranoia of humanity around the world and the more volatile it became the 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 slower it took us to learn what was going on and that was like the major antagonist in the movie there is a a thing that books can do that movies cannot and that is tell you a story with prose that that the word choices themselves tell you something about the story you're inside of. There's multiple levels of it. I mean, you can tell a story in a very straightforward manner. You can, like the Isaac Asimov was famous for that, like the most straightforward prose you could possibly do. No flower in it at all. And then there's super flowery prose. But, but one of the things that Ted Chang is amazing at is word choice, perfect prose word choice to give you a, a feeling, an emotion, a sense of what's happening just by the choice of the word that he used. And that doesn't translate to the screen. You can't do that on the screen. And I think more than almost any other story that Ted has done, story of your life is a a beautiful, perfect example of that. The prose that he uses in that story pulls you through the story and tells you what the story is as you're learning, you know, as you go, as you're learning the language along with Louise, the prose that he's using is giving you that, that, feeling that she's feeling as she's moving through it and stuff. Since I, since you can't do that visually, I think they had to do the version they did, which is to sort of separate it out, give her more of a clear arc, start her in a normal place that we will understand and, and follow her visually through the story. 
Yeah, and I think too, like the themes of communication and paranoia, you have a little bit more space within the in the film, and it's almost like you know you have these beings come down from outer space. You know, there, it's really a scenario where you're examining ourselves. We're examining human nature through these because the aliens are almost kind of like a blank screen, right? They're not aggressive. They don't do and they help us along and learn, but they're just. And so it's just us reacting to them, like all of our weaknesses, all of our vulnerabilities, all of our projections. There was a moment when when he said, you know, they might be pitting us against each other to try to take each other out. And she's like, well, there's no evidence of that. And he's like, pick up a history book. That's a history of us. It's not a history of them. And right. so, you know, they're, 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 they're responding to who we are on the inside. And it's almost like we don't know how to operate if we're not withholding, being secret, or competing with one another with different nations, right? Different nations, but also sex within our nations. That was the struggle and the conflict. And so they're ex- exploring this through this idea. And you, I think you could get more into it because you have a little bit more room with the movie. And, you know, initially I did not like when I first saw Arrival, I did not like him bringing the bomb in and blowing it up and, uh, you know, that, that whole thing in the movie. But then I thought about it and, and I was like, you know what? The hepapods are having the same choices that Louise is having where they know, already know what's going to happen, but they know that this is set out before them. This is what it's going to be. So they, they still go through with the thing that they're going through with. And it also speaks a little bit about fear and paranoia and how easily manipulated we can be, even if you just don't do anything. I hate the bomb. I think it's the dumbest fucking thing in the movie. I but, hate it. It's, it is a literal ticking clock. It is literally a ticking clock in the middle of this otherwise beautiful and yeah. emotional and, and, and subtle and well thought out and intellectual movie. And they put a literal ticking clock in the movie and it, and it felt like the most studio note moment in the entire movie. It felt like, it felt like somebody at the studio went, well, don't, we need some physical threat. We need some stakes. We need some danger. What if, what if they brought a bomb and they put a Mm -hmm. bomb in there and, oh no, the bomb is going to go off. And does she have time to disarm the bomb? It's the dumbest fucking moment in the entire movie. It drives me nuts. It, it makes me think of every bad note I ever got. So I had the same exact reaction as you did the first time I saw it. And that's why I almost didn't like the movie. It took me out. And so I didn't yeah. really pay as much attention. I was like, what the fuck is this? In watching it again and how they set up this soldier becoming like that, like even though it's sloppily done, I mean, after January 6th, after a lot of the shit that went down, you can see this and you see how – people were spiraling out of control. There was all these different narratives of like this and, and you know, there's commentaries like they don't even have fucking guns going on the ship. Like, what are they doing? Da, da, da. And then, you know, they're, they're cutting off their communications. They're not sharing the information with each other and it's become uh, fragmented and, and art. And, and, and so then you can see like, Oh yeah, he's doing the stupid fucking most fucking thing possible. But we do that shit all the time. <laughs> we do that. We constantly do that. And so that I felt like, I was I was more accepting of it in this watch. And then when I when she went back to see the hepapod after that and she's like, where's the other hepapod? And he's like, well, he's in the death cycle now. And she's like, wait a minute. He knew this, but he made the choice anyway, which I think in, in saying that is kind of the, one of the third alterations. And the thing is that the, the girl, the way her little girl died. So in the in the story, she died in a, I think it was a rock climbing accident. But in the in the movie, she had this incurable disease, and I think it was because in the book, what she, what Louise comes to realize is like it's very deterministic that life like she's already lived it, living it, and will live it. So there isn't there's not it's already set before her and and she can just be present and observe and take in and live the life that she's already lived. In the movie, I feel like there's they inserted more of a um free will into it where she makes the choice. So she even know that she knows she's living this circular life, she still has choice and she still has agency and she says in there I I could have avoided this, but when she's with You know, they set it up at the very end when he says, do you want to make a baby? And you see her make that choice. And I think it's really compelling. And it's always a great story thing when you see them making the choice at the end to 
get to know her daughter and how beautiful it is, their relationship, and be able to experience that even though she knows how it's going to end. They made it an incurable disease because that's something that you, you can't mess with that. You know, she, she could, it's not like you can stop her from, you, you can stop her from rock climbing, but you can't stop her from getting this re, uh, incurable disease that she's going to get. That's not a change I like in the movie. I, I got to admit, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be mentioning things, some things with a negative tone of voice, but I, I want to repeat that. I love this movie. I think it's a great movie. I think it's a beautiful movie. There are some story choices that I don't love. One of them is the stupid fucking ticking clock. But the other one is, <laughs> is so I, I knew you were going to get fired up about that. And I was Ted's, like, that's Ted's what I was point. Just- Ted's point in the book. And I think he's right. He's got the right of this, that, this language is both an amazing new way to view the universe, and it is also a trap. That there is, there is an element to once you have viewed the future, you are now trapped by that future. It's, 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 a, it's a point that um, the books, the Dune books make with, with Paul, and, and when he gains his, his powers, Moadib, when he gains his powers, to the golden path to see the future, that he is trapped by that future. Once he's seen it, can't escape it. And, and I like that Ted is playing with that version of this, that, that her being able to see the future doesn't turn into a superpower. Like if you can see the future and then you can change it, you can make a decision to do something different, then it's a superpower now, right? Then you, then you become a superhero. You become future man, right? And you, now you can like, oh, I see in the future I'm going to be shot by this guy, so instead I'll do this other thing. It turns into that uh, terrible Nicolas Cage movie, uh, Next or whatever. Where he's like, he got the power to see the future and stuff. I like that what Ted is telling is a melancholy story. A, a sad story about this woman who, ha- who gains this incredible insight by learning this alien language. And part of the side effect of this learning this language is this new way of viewing time. You know, this, the, like you said, you know, you're, you're viewing the past, the future, and the present all sort of at the same moment. That that seems amazing, but it is it is a trap that she's mm-hmm. now trapped by, mm-hmm. and the sadness that comes with that, and the way that she determines it doesn't matter that I know that this thing ends badly. I'm still going to enjoy living through it while I'm in it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that is the beauty of the story. I think that is the beautiful point of the story. And by doing the superpower version where she could choose not to do it, I think you rob it of that power. I think you steal that from the story. So I, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree that, that that's a good change. Yeah, and, and I, I hear what you're saying, and I loved both versions. And what's interesting is Chang's version, it, it, was, it, it was a bit, it did have a melancholy tone and feel it to it and a message to it. But I also, at the same time, like it floored me, but I also felt, hope, uh, felt hopeful, you know, at the same time. Like there was a certain beauty in, in life and in the experience of life. Yeah. And the reality is, is that, even though you're living the happy moments, you have the knowledge that it's all going to end. But right. when you're living in the end, you are also having the knowledge that you're going to live. The, it's all happening at the same time. So it's all intertwined. It's all, it's, it enriches things. It makes, um, and I, so and I, oh, I find that ahead, sorry. fascinating. Sorry, I find that fascinating. But I do like the movie's idea of it. I do like her making the choice that even everything that she knows and she has a choice um, she makes the choice to go through everything again. Yeah, the, the problem with that is that it is not well thought out. Because if you're seeing the future all the time, and, and every choice you make is, is reorienting that future, then, then you're living like this constant dizzying realteration of, because you know if you reach for a coffee cup, and you see in the future, your hand bumps it and knocks it over and spills it on the floor. And so now you don't reach. And so now the future doesn't have the spilled coffee on the floor. And that's going to ripple out through the entire future. So it would, be, it would be impossible. It would be maddening, right? You, every moment, every move you made would create these ripples throughout the future that your brain would be having to now reorient to this new version of the future. It's not well thought out. The only version of that that makes any sense is Ted's version, which is that if you can see the future, that means the future already exists. That means it's already set. 
It's it is the deterministic version. So what you were saying about knocking over the coffee cup and everything, that's very linear. That's linear and and that is not the way that they're living. So in some ways, they're really kind of the same thing where you're living you're living in the past and the present and the future all at the same time, which means you've made the choices, the choices are made in and it's all in the same loop. It's all in the same right, thing. But that means that she's not making the choice. But she the made end. the choice once. She, yeah, the she choice a, has been made. The choice has already been made. Right. right. So, so it, is, it is the deterministic version of the story. Yeah, but, the, but there was a choice she that have was chose, made. She couldn't have chosen not to because she'd already seen that she had made the choice. She couldn't have chosen not to because she's already made the choice. Right. Well, you, we, we, uh, then it's not a choice. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, I mean, there was a choice at one point, um, but, you know, the idea of this, this beings coming down and then to truly understand them, we need to learn their language. And then it really, t- it teaches you a lot about language and how to truly understand other people. We need to learn their language and language goes beyond just words and phrases and the order of what those words are. You have to really understand their history and their context. And, yeah. and the more you dive into that and learn their language, you start to think like them. Uh, you know, we've been talking about aliens a lot this past, uh, um, and to me, it's on, the, this it's, is, in, it's on our minds, man. It's in the collective consciousness. It's in the You're collective driven con- by the zeitgeist It's it's in the collective consciousness. But what's interesting to me about is this is one of the more interesting interactions with aliens in any of yeah. the film or stories that I've read. Yeah. Because rarely do you get that deep sense of these beings and then who they are, but really you're just seeing yourself reflected in them. Or characters in the story are seeing themselves reflected into these aliens. They're almost neutral. It's like you're looking into this thing, and they're allowing you to go through all of those phases, go through all of those things, and then you start to listen. And then when you start to listen and learn their language, then you start to experience like, oh, it, it, this is uh, this understanding of reality is beyond our paradigm uh, for our understanding. It's something completely new and different. So us looking at history books is not going to help us anything going forward. Writing truly alien aliens is really fucking hard to do. <laughs> it is uh, fucking hard. I mean, that, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. I was, I was just going to say there's there's a reason why all the aliens in Star Trek are just bumpy headed humans. <laughs> Right. And, and they, seem and they to all have about, human motivations. They all they have all, human motivations. They want yeah. money. They want power. They want they, you know all that stuff. Yeah. I've always wanted to make love with an alien. Like they're basically just us with bumpy heads. Right. There's a reason for that because coming up with a truly alien alien is really fucking hard. And Ted in in Arrival does a beautiful job of creating a truly alien alien. And what happens when you have a truly alien alien, um, because this is something that happened to us with the expanse, not that we're nearly as good as Ted. I am not making that comparison. We're not as good as Ted, but, but the same thing happened to us, which is that when humans are presented with the truly genuinely alien, they do exactly what you said. They turn it into a mirror. They start projecting onto it all of the things that they think, they start anthropomorphizing it. They, oh, oh, it must want this. It must feel this way. But no, it's always a projection of their own shit because that's the only thing we're left with when we're faced with something that is incomprehensible. Mm-hmm. We are left with, we have to assign motives to it and the only motives we know are the ones we have. That was one of the things we tried to do with the protomolecule in, in the expanses. The protomolecule is a mirror. If, you, if you're looking for a weapon, you find a weapon. If you're looking for God, you find God. If you're looking for, you know, like the way to transcend human Im- limitations, that's what you find. It becomes a mirror that just bounces back to you at the, st- the stuff you're projecting at it. <laughs> right. It's like the cantina in Star Wars. It's like, oh, so all of these aliens work in a factory and they're Americanized and they like to go have a bud after work. Yeah, pretty and like, much. <laughs> and getting fist fights and like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's even like, oh, that's very specific. And these are a lot of different races from a lot of different galaxies and a lot of different places. But they all and like to go have a beer aliens, after work. And, and apparently all aliens love jazz. <laughs> <laughs> There's one universal music that it's plays jazz, man. in the universe. It's yeah. jazz, man. It's jazz. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that's interesting is uh, in the story of your life that goes more, it, it gets more involved in the communication. And some of the 
basic mathematics and stuff that they were trying to communicate mathematically, it didn't really even register. They didn't even, but when they got into some complicated math, like light and how light reflects off water, uh, there's a certain, you probably know the term, there's a term for that, like measurement of light off water. Then the hepapods responded. So even their idea of mathematics and physics are so different from ours, and there's some intersection but the basics, they, like, so maybe like basic algebra, they have different, they came up with a different system. And right. then some of the more advanced, like when you get to calculus and things that like, there's some crossover, like, okay, we get that, we understand that. And, you know, but this is what probably is more efficient for you to use this. Yeah, but you know, and, and, and basic physics, things uh-huh. like the way light hits water, you know, the speed of light in a vacuum, gravitational measurements, things like that, those are going to be universal. No matter Mm -hmm. what physiology an alien has, no matter what mental process they have, if they have studied the universe around them, they're going to have hit on those exact same principles, right? So I I like how that does become the common language, is is we all understand that light goes this fast. It hits water and it does this thing, because it always does that no matter where you are in the universe and no matter what physiology you have. So I, I like that being the universal language. Yeah. You know, uh, t- going back to our ongoing conversation about aliens, and um, I came across something recently called the Great Filter. Have you heard of this? Yes. Yep. The way I understand it is there are big moments in all development of life. So if you, you kind of take humanity as a model where you start from the primordial ooze and then you evolve all the way up to a fully formed human being, um, or even like the dinosaurs and there's the, you know, if there's asteroids hit the earth when the dinosaurs vibe and wiped out all the dinosaurs, or if we, if we decide to have a nuclear war and wipe out all of humanity, that there's these great filters. So another element in like the odds of an advanced civilization finding us in this world is like, they got to make it through all their filters because they have to evolve from the very beginning all the way into a, into a being that has the technology and the wherewithal to come visit us. And so they have to make it through all their filters. And they're, they might have, I mean, you know, we're pretty, we got it pretty good here on Earth with the atmosphere and the oxygen and everything. They might live in a lot more hostile environment, a lot more volatile environment. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the idea that, you know, the Ice Age or, you know, what happened with the dinosaurs or even our own destruction, causing our own destruction with nuclear war or things like that, that is very likely to, to wipe things out, you know? So to be able to have, you know, one that makes it all the way through and they're evolved enough to come fly around with the Navy F-18 pilots, you know, it's, it's highly unlikely. Well, and, and one of the things we did in the expanse books, um, and uh, this is a very minor spoiler for the last three expanse books. I won't get into too much detail is try to come up with an alien species that had a completely different great filter than us that didn't have the same uh, survival pressures early on that we had or had very different ones and discovered its great filter in a very unexpected way. Yeah. Um, so, so what the filter is co- changes completely depending on the biology of the life form, the environment that you like. You're talking about how the, the earth is pretty comfy you know, the, the, bio, the biology of the life form in the environment that it's in, all of those things become part of the filtration process and they can be completely different depending on the species and the location. So you know, coming up with a new sort of great filter for an alien, a truly alien species uh, was, was a bit of tricky work. Sorry, listeners, this is so fucking boring. Ty, we should come on next. The, our next podcast should be playing the devil's advocate and trying to convince each other that there are aliens in that. And the, we would get way, we would be way more interesting to listen to when we're just buzz killing. <laughs> I, 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 I firmly believe that the best way to get a huge follower count on YouTube is to hate stuff. So we, we need to find something that yeah, we dude, just we break, fucking we break hate. all the rules. We don't yeah. hate things Move into the dark side. We, yeah. we, don't, we don't hate things. And we we're we're, we try to be realistic about UFOs and aliens. Um, well, let's just fucking complete. Let's dive completely into conspiracy theories. Let's dive into the existence of aliens, and let's let's hate some shit. You, yeah, let's you, hate some shit. Have you seen anything that you you haven't hated? Uh, we should come up with hated? a list of stuff we hate, and then we yeah. can do and we can do the 
<laughs> Ty and that guy hating on shit episode. We, we, should, we should do the top five hate. Just yes. the top five hate. It doesn't even have to be movies. Just things in life that we hate. Uh, Joseph, mark that down. We're, we need to do an episode <laughs> okay. where it's the just Wes and I just hating on shit. No, um, I, 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 I spent a bunch of money building a very nice uh, home theater system in my house during COVID or just before the big COVID lockdown. Right. And I got very, very comfortable watching movies at my house. And I just don't feel the urge to go out and rub elbows with other people to see a movie anymore. I love going to movies. One of my favorite things. I used to. I used to. Uh, there, uh, okay, so mark this down as something we can talk about in our hate episode. I came to hate the theater experience in the like year or two before COVID hit. There are things that it started happening over that couple of years that made me hate going to the movies. And then when COVID hit and I started watching all the movies at home, I'm like, win win, right? Like, I don't have to put up with that shit that always happens at theaters. What, it, and, what is it? Like, what do you hate? Like, people talking through movies or checking their phones or. Yeah, everybody being on their fucking phone through the whole movie. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if, if, there, was, if there was an Alamo draft house in a town near me, I would probably go there. Because the mm-hmm. thing I love about the Alamo draft house is they have very strict rules on shut the fuck up and leave mm-hmm. your phone in your pocket. Right. right? Yeah. And, if you, and if you do that shit in an Alamo draft house and get caught by the staff, they, they'll just kick you out. And so my- I, I like that. Yeah, my favorite way to watch a movie is at random times. I like to be the I like to be by myself, and I like to be the only one there. And if there's like then two, why not or three, watch it at mm-hmm. home? <laughs> because I like the experience of going to the theater. I like the okay. experience. I like to smell the popcorn. I like to like uh, go and get the ticket and walk in right. and sit down and like I like that feeling. I mean, I watch movies at home too, but it, to me, it's does it doesn't. There's something about going to see movies that is the the experience is uh, more powerful for me. It's it's fantastic, and and Denis Villeneuve and is another one like you watch Arrival. He's so skilled and so good at what he's done. Even yeah. though maybe he had a weakness with the studio note, what I, which in retrospect I watch now and I look at it and I don't mind it. It makes sense to me. It feels like it feels like that was their version of January Six. Like there's people that get like so spun up, so paranoid. They're believing this shit, this crazy shit, and then he's fucking gonna. It's just ridiculous that he's gonna do that, but. That the people are doing I, ridiculous things. I believe, I believe that people are that stupid. Absolutely. But, but one thing that Daniel says all the time um, that I agree with is just because something is true doesn't make it good storytelling. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, 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 yes, I believe people are stupid enough to do shit like that. I don't think it's a good storytelling choice. But I That's thought the reaction of the hippopods to the event was interesting. I sure. thought it was interesting to me. I feel um, like we could have got to that place with a less clunky. Yeah, mechanism. it was sloppy and it didn't have it was to be sloppy. that sloppy. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's the top five, Joe? Oh, is it top five Denis movies? You got it. This will be a short one since not a ton of them, but one of the patrons mentioned this one, which I now need to see. He's like a movie where a fish is talking. <laughs> hmm. I never even heard of that. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. In cities is in Cindy's is amazing. It's a it's an amazing movie. And I, I'm gonna say for me, my favorite Denis movie ever is still Sicario. Yeah, I, I think, agree. I think Sicario is a incredible achievement in cinema. When we first saw, when I first knew we were doing this, I just have a special place in my heart for Sicario, and I think that. There's so much that I love about Sicario, but one of the things is, is that there's, it, there's a lot of horror techniques in Sicario yep. with music and camera yep. techniques and the way that was sh- is shot, but you get the sense that there's an evil that's across, that's coming this way that we are ill-equipped to, to be able to, to handle, that is yep. beyond our understanding or our skills. And when uh, Benicio Del Toro is talking to her at the end, and she's like, he's like, <laughs> basically, there's a new breed. And yep. you were ill-equipped for this new breed. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's interesting because it's the same idea that is expressed at the end of No, no Country, Country for Old Men. Men. Yeah. You got a lawman who has a certain idea of what lawmen do and is ill-equipped to handle this new thing that's happening, doesn't understand it. Yeah, and Sicario does an amazing job of that, of, of sort of laying out this, this idea that this isn't, 
this isn't criminals. This isn't cops and robbers. This is a monster yeah. reaching across the border, and it's going to eat everything it touches. Yeah, I would put Incendies as number two. That's that's another achievement. That might have been his first movie too. I, I, now I I like I like Incendies a lot, but I I, I like Arrival better. But I would I I, I think for me Arrival has got to be two or three. Yeah, and I think Blade Runner twenty forty nine is astonishing to look at it's a beautiful movie and it's like the cinematography won i I believe the cinematography won the academy award and it should have it was amazing all of my problems with blade runner 2049 are on the story side yeah see i'm a story guy i do not like that script (laughs) i'm a story guy and no matter how beautiful something is which it was it was extraordinary and very skillfully done the story wasn't there for me so yeah like i like dune i absolutely love I thought it was fantastic. I was not as big a fan of Dune as everybody else. I think again, I think I think it's beautiful to look at, but it is such a stripped down version of the story. Well, that, it's um, it, it's interesting yeah. because I saw it with two of my friends that have never read the book and have never seen the David Lynch movie in the eighties. Yeah. And so I didn't say anything about it. We watched it and then I asked them what was going on? What did they understand? Because there was no uh, voiceover. And, you yep. know, and obviously the book is all subtext. And so I was asking them, and they fully got pretty oh, much yeah. everything that was happening. And that's, that's a brilliant thing to do, to be able to, to communicate that story visually. Yep. Mind-blowing. It is. It's, it is. It, and I, and I, think, uh, I think it's a good, it, you know, my complaint about Blade Runner uh, is about the story. I think, I think it's a good script. I think John... Uh, John Spates wrote the script. I think John wrote a great script for Dune. I think Denise shot an amazing movie. I should love that movie. It's just so not what Dune is in my head because I've read the book so many times that it kind of blocks me from appreciating it as much as I think everybody else does. How about Prisoners? I think Prisoners is is a pretty great movie. Um, I think I saw Prisoners first. Yeah. And then I saw Sicario, and like right away, I was like, every movie that he was coming out with, I, I was like, I have to see it. Yeah. Now, I'll admit, I did watch Enemies after Prisoners, and I was just like, eh. Enemy is the most what the fuck movie that I yes. saw that year. Where I'm watching, I'm like, what the fuck? What is, what is even happening? What is this movie about? I think, it's, I think it's fascinating the first time you watch it, and then when you realize, like, Oh, that's that's it, huh? And then it just kind of like, yeah, okay. I, I mean, if that was the top five, I would be fine with that. I don't love Dune as much as everybody else does, but I recognize that it is objectively a very well-made movie with a great script and beautiful direction and good performances, all of the things that should make it great. Yeah, I'm it a Dune fan, and I, and, and I loved it. Um, I, I'm, I'm a Dune fan as well. I mean, Ty, it... it Tell you, it had your it had your girl in there, man. It had our girl I know. in there. It does. It does. I mean, she she ran the Benny Jesuits, or she, she would. did. Yeah, that was so sexy <laughs> when she told that guy to slit his throat. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, hold on. Now he didn't direct this movie, but if he would have directed Die Hard, <laughs> that would have been the best movie on this list by far. I, you know, there's a part of me now that wants to see the Denis Villeneuve version of Die Hard. <laughs> Die Hard. Ha- Javier Bardem as as uh, as the bad guy, right? Oh, Javier Bardem as as Gruber would be amazing. Would Brolin be McLean in the alternate version? You know what? I could totally I could totally see a Josh Brolin McLean. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be, I'd be on that train. Yeah, I'd go see that. Absolutely. Movie. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna have my agent contact Denis's agent and. Uh, We'll get this ball rolling. All right, let's see how the patrons did. Wow, they put Blade Runner in the top five. All right. Yep, they respected the the classics. Got everything. I would say, you know, Blade Runner, yeah, that's the one the one outlier. I'm a bigger fan of uh, Prisoners. Yep. I mean, I only watched it once, you know, I should, but I was disappointed in that. And it could have been. I mean, it, it could have been. Could have yep. been. Because there had was a the, lot of had all the was, pieces. There was a lot of promise in the first act. Yep, I agree. All righty. Thank you guys for hanging out. Please like and subscribe. Ring that little bell. Uh, say goodbye, Ty. 
Goodbye, Ty.